So let's talk about how some of these decay schemes actually work in radioactive decay. Some atoms have a nuclei that can exist in an ex excited state. And this is not an uncommon thing, but most nuclei that are, are end up in an excited state as part of radioactive decay immediately go back to a ground state. And they don't exist in that metastable state for very long. When they decay to that ground state, they release uh, a gamma ray photon. Um, it comes from the nucleus there as that uh, atom goes from that excited state down to its ground state. Now radionuclides that can exist in that excited state for a relatively long time, and we're talking about a relatively long time on the atomic scale, so greater than 10 to the minus 12 seconds, are referred to as being metastable. All right. And the most important metastable um, uh, radionuclide that you should know of that decays via isomeric transition is technetium 99M. I mean, as a matter of fact, technetium 99M. The M is for metastable. And clearly technetium 99M, right, it's, it's a real outlier there because this exists in that excited state for quite a bit of time, right? We've talked about the fact that its half-life is around six hours. Um, what's nice about isomeric transition? Well, we get decay to that stable state and we get this release of this gamma ray. So that gamma ray is given off. Here we see that happening. That's labeled one in this picture here. Um, sometimes we don't see that gamma ray produced. Sometimes that excess energy in the nucleus gets transferred to one of these orbital electrons, typically a K-shell electron here, and we get what are called these uh, internal conversion electrons, these electrons which are going to head off with kinetic energy that would be equal to what this gamma ray energy would have been minus the binding shell energy of that electron, these internal conversion electrons. Unfortunately, they're going to deposit dose in the patient, right, the, the negative effect of, of, of this here. And once that's gone, of course, the uh, characteristic X-ray production can occur, right, where this L-shell electron is going to come in and fill that slot and give rise to that characteristic X-ray. Or sometimes this energy difference gets imparted to an outer shell electron and we get the production of those OJ electrons. So things that we've talked about before. But in isomeric transition, the main thing that happens is the rise of this gamma ray here. And as a matter of fact, in technetium 99M, 88% of the decays result in the production of this, this gamma ray here. Only about 12% of the events result in um, internal conversion electron. Of course, we'd love it to be zero, right, because that would be less dose in the patient. So really, what would be the ideal characteristics for us in terms of a radiopharmaceutical? Well, you know, we'd really love to have something that has a relatively short half-life, right? That way, if it stayed in the body, it would decay fairly quickly and we wouldn't end up with a, a long-term exposure to that person and, and people around them. But, you know, we don't want it too short. I mean, if the half-life is a matter of seconds, how do we get our imaging done that we want, want to get done? We really would love monochromatic gamma ray production, right? And we'd love the energy of those gamma rays to be sufficient enough that they escape the body, right? That the body doesn't absorb them all because there's such low energy and the dose is just all deposited in the body. But we'd like the energy to be low enough that we can actually do a decent job stopping them with our camera or our detector. We'd love them to have minimal production of particulate radiation, such as those beta particles, or in creation of those internal conversion or OJ electrons. And we'd love for the, to, that radiopharmaceutical to lo localize itself at that organ of interest, be relatively non-toxic, have high radionuclide, radiochemical, and chemical purity. And of course, we'd love it to be inexpensive and readily available. Boy, that's a pipe dream, right? But th those you know, technetium 99M as a, a radionuclide comes really close to some of the properties that we, we talked about. Uh, it's, and that's why you see it used in various labeled forms to perform greater than 80% of the non-PET nuclear studies. It decays with 88% of its nuclear transformation resulting in the emission of 
140 keV, about 140.5, 141 keV photon, which is great, right? That's ideal, escapes the body like we talked about, still low enough that we can stop it fairly readily. Unfortunately, the remaining 12% results in these uh, energetic electrons and deposits dose in the patient, but that's a relatively small amount. And for that reason, there's been a lot of chemistry uh, does, de uh, developed around technetium. The other thing that's nice about technetium is we can really get technetium fairly readily using a molybdenum generator. So here's a alumina absorbed with molybdenum, and as it decays, some of that decays to technetium, it becomes water soluble in that. And so here's a sterilized solution of saline connected through that column via this tubing. And if you popped an evacuated vial onto the little uh, needle, if you will, on the top of this, it would suck that fluid past that column, taking off the soluble technetium, and you'd end up with technetium in your vial, and hopefully it was working well, and you ended up with very minimal amount of breakthrough of molybdenum in your vial there. How many people still get a technetium generator like this delivered to their hospital here? So there's some, you know, more and more it's becoming, doses are becoming available if you especially live in a, a fairly well populated metropolitan area where you can have your technetium delivered to you on a per dose basis. You tell them what time your study is going to occur, they will send you the unit dose that you need such that at that time it would have decayed to exactly what you needed, needed it to be. Um, but some places still have their generator that they use e each day. And if you have the generator, one of the things that you know that's really nice about it is if you start off with no technetium and just your molybdenum and you watch after about a 24-hour period, you reach a peak in the amount of technetium that's available there. So you can take all the technetium from the generator and then let the next 24-hour period go on where, again, that amount of technetium was going to rise over time as that molybdenum decays until it's time to elute the generator once again. So it's really nice to set up. The, the ratio of half-lives between molybdenum and technetium are such that you end up in this transient equilibrium that reaches its maximum right around 24 hours, which is really convenient for what we do, where each morning we'd want to elute the generator and start our imaging for the day, if you will. I already mentioned that the fact that in nuclear medicine we're really trying to image physiology, right? And so that a lot of radiopharmaceuticals have been designed for that purpose. And if you go back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you had a lot of people doing radiochemistry in your nuclear medicine department to try and prepare things for you. And more and more those have been co uh, converted to commercial kits where you take that tech pertechnitate, that technetium that you've eluded from the generator, and you inject it into a vial using a syringe, and you do minimal things to either agitate that or heat it or just uh, process it to get your radiopharmaceutical there. And that minimizes the need to really perform chemi chemistry with radioactive materials in the nuclear medicine department. So, for instance, here's one of the MAG-3, one of the renal scan agents, right? And basically, you just pop this vial out, top off, and, and inject the appropriate amount of pertechnitate in there.